just going to introduce to the stage Andy Richardson Kindry. And she will say who she is. It's all yours. All right. Um, I'm Andy. I come from Australia. Actually, I was born in California, but I lived there for the last 50 years. And there I'm. Um, this is my notes. Just because I'm 83, I have to rely on this. And I hate my clothes because anytime I hold anything this close to my mouth, I want to lick it. <laughs> okay. So I am officially an African American Australian. And now that I've turned 83, I'm actually more than a triple A, I'm a quad A. I'm an ancient African American Australian. And I'm glad to be reading. My connection to Star Trek came because of my connection to Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Malana Karinga, and Medgar Evers. I was involved in civil rights. It was so strong, my book. I had been tripping on Owsley Acid at a love-in in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park when I heard that Watts had exploded. Damn! The revolution had started without me. I needed to get there in a hurry so I could participate in bringing about real change. And if that meant burning down the old, I was okay with that. So my work with Martin and Medgar and Malcolm had given me this sense of responsibility that things had to change. So I got there. And... My Lana was good in another way because he introduced me to science fiction. My very first Ray Bradbury story, The Lake, made me want to know more and hear more, read more. I love the medium. So when once had exploded and I went down there to be part of it, afterwards, it did something important. It made people realize of the discrimination that existed the inequality in work opportunities. And Lucille Ball at Disney Studio recruited a couple of black people to come and work there. I worked in radio, so that was close enough for them. It was just television, but more got pictures and the same kind of sound. But I wasn't sure, it was a new world to me. But luckily, like any good zoo, they hired two of us, a male and a female, so we'd have company. <laughs> we'd nod and we saw each other. But that was about it. So I got comfortable. I was the floater secretary. I was working all over the lot. I was working in every department, art department, props department, the Mission Impossible, Maddox. I was working at Star Trek. I was working all over the place. And I got more and more confident as I did. And although I was still too chicken to let them see I had an afro underneath my wig, I did start to let my skirts get shorter and shorter. And then I got a note, an inner office memson, a memo in all caps, many skirts are not appropriate for work. They were on Star Trek. <laughs> so Gene Kuhn came along and I started working for him he liked my mini skirts <laughs> he liked them so much he said hey Andy why don't you work with me I like your mini skirts <laughs> and see things happened back then that today people would go to jail for but <laughs> there you're supposed to run and bear and laugh it off but it was true I mean, Michelle wrote in her book that I had legs Tina Turner would envy. Um, we won't talk about it now. Why did I write a book? That book? This book? This book? Why did I do that? Because Gene Kuhn died before he could speak for himself. Other people quoted him and said things about him. I spent a lot of time with him. When he left Star Trek, I went with him. I say a lot, I spent a lot of time with him. He and Martin Luther King had many things in common, one of which they both 
respected the philosopher Reinhardt. Reinhardt. Okay, guys, I just lost his last name. Niebuhr. Thank you. You want to say it louder? <laughs> Niebuhr. Reinhardt Niebuhr. Yeah, okay. Hmm. So, I needed to write a book. I had to talk about him. And I got lucky. I had two people that helped me get along the way. Because I'm not a writer, and I couldn't afford a ghostwriter. That's why mine's a bit bumpy in places. But these two people were absolutely invaluable. And one of them is Larry. Dr. Trek, where are you? Dr. Trek, I need you. Dr. Trek, please go. Okay. All right. That's it. And for me, a real trekker. I know Frankie has drinks Star Trek wine. I know she's been on at least one Star Trek cruise. And she took time out in her busy life as a mother and worker to read the book and give me feedback. Frankie Ingelberg. Hey. So guys, I'm not alone. I still got company. Okay. We're gonna put you in the middle where you belong. I like to be in the middle. When I, when I was working at Star Trek, I used to sometimes go to uh, Star Trek stage by way of the Mission Impossible stage. And there were two of the actors there that used to make me a bit of a sandwich. They'd give me hugs in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Who were they? Um, Peter... Lupus? Lupus. Yes. No, 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 the total blonde guy. Great. Oh, Landau uh -huh. and the lead. Oh, right. a Peter Graves. 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 Peter Graves. 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 And they'd be one in front of me, one in the back of me, squeezing me, and Barbara would, Barbara would sit there going, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> and I thought, that little fat kid in junior high school didn't know she was going to end up like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about junior high school. You had a really, I, I got to tell everybody, this is a, you're part of history tonight yeah. in many ways. And one of the ways is we tried to do this Five years ago, 2017, yes. you were part of a trip, and I'll say in a minute, but we had the chance to get you on stage at the last minute at STLV, and we could not sway the powers that be at the last minute. And we said, we're going to get you here by hook or by crook sometime. I but went one night to, uh, one afternoon to Burbank, and that was a place I didn't go. Do you know that Burbank used to be a sunset town? Uh -oh. yeah. It's not the only one. Yeah. yeah, there were a few of them around, but you didn't dare, if you were black, you didn't dare be the other side down. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> and I went there, and I went to their office, and I saw it had a door with a lock on it. So I stood there for a long time, hoping somebody would come out or go in so I could say, please, please, let me go. But they didn't, so I left. But we and got it. But the reason it. you were here in the States from Australia, where you've been for, what, 50 years now? Yeah, 50 years. You were here, really headed for Texas, because... My slave ancestors, my grandmother's grandmother, Winnie, was a slave, and her, she married another slave. They couldn't really get married because slaves were not allowed to marry. They could cohabit because they could make more slaves, but they couldn't marry, but they formed a, a, a bond, and they made a ceremony, and they considered themselves married. And when she got sold, he ran away. She, he, they were in Mississippi. She got sold to Texas. Jim Shankel, her husband, got to the Mississippi River, and he shouldn't. He couldn't catch a ferry because he was a runaway slave. They were looking for him because if they found him, he was going back. Plus, they could just sell him for more money because he was very skilled. So what did he do? He swam across the Mississippi River. He was not letting anything keep him away from that woman. And when he found her in Texas, he voluntarily went back into slavery in order to be with her. So what they did when they were freed on Juneteenth, a year after slavery, they finally found out about it, that they were free, and they established a Texas freedom colony where they built houses, they created businesses, and lived pretty good. And so their name was? Shackleville. Yes. And Shackleville is still in existence, and we still go there for reunions each year. They still have the purple hull pea festival there, <laughs> and the scholarship for our kids. Right. But it, what was it, centennial, or it was not it 150 years? I think it was about it. But they had you come over special. 
five yeah. years ago. Yeah. Right. They paid your way, and that's what got you to our shores, and that's what they, back, and that's what we, we got to meet up. You had old friends, you had new friends, and that's we hatched this idea to get you here. Yeah, and I'm here. And we got you in the building, and we got you around to some people, but not here. So we, this is paying off that. Yes. Yeah. And in the meantime, a lot of us said, Andy, you need to you need to do a book. You need to get that book started. I could I didn't want to write a book. My kids said, Grandma, who are our people? Who do we come from? I thought, oh, okay, I write about the slaves. Okay. And then another another a kid of my grandkids said, Grandma, who introduced you to Martin Luther King and Malcolm X? So I thought, oh, I'm gonna have to tell that story. <laughs> And then the youngest one, smart ass, <laughs> he said, Grandma, I heard you worked on Star Trek. I have never seen you there. <laughs> so I tried to write it, didn't work. I turned it into a solo show because I could sit up on stage on a chair with a glass of water and run my mouth, and that's what I did. <laughs> but the COVID, that gave me a chance to write. <laughs> and you guys kept me writing. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. So let's. So you, you, and you got through the basics there, but there's so many good little tangents along the way. So when you talk about how you, got, you used to tell this story about you were born. What was it? Just in oh, San Diego? Was, What's how was the way you born? I was born on the border, uh, San Diego. I born on the Mexican border, but I wasn't born Mexican. I was born white. See, there's always that silence after I say that. It's like they're saying, what the is she talking about? <laughs> well, that's what it said on my birth certificate. Andre, Cecilia, white. <laughs> yeah, because? Because I was the daughter of Cindy and Olivia White. Aha, uh -huh. okay. <laughs> well, how did you, what's the story between that moment and when you walked in the front door? At Desi Lou, because you had a lot of stops along the way. You kind of mentioned a few of them. You were in the music business, the music industry. No, I was in radio. That's right. <laughs> and I'd come that back, and, and Malcolm had been killed, and that broke my heart. And I was working champion, and they told me that since I refused to do anything to support the, anybody who was working on any for South Africa because of apartheid that I should probably look for another kind of job. And that was the place you were working at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was sort of when I went to Watts, I went there because I thought we were gonna make change. We were, we were gonna make a difference. And and that had been my wish, my desire, my dream, my hope. And a lot of people got killed. They we called it the a watch. riot. We called it a revolt. I mean, people were rebelling against Prop 14, and other people were working cooperatively to carry around waste soup, sofas, refrigerators, washing machines. <laughs> but all that cooperation was wonderful to see. <laughs> Until the first uh, trash day came along and the police came with the garbage trucks and every place that had a thrown away sofa, refrigerator, washing machine was asked, can you please show us a receipt for your new purchases? Yeah. Anyhow, thank you. What's happening with you? What are you thinking about? Um, I'm thinking it's pretty amazing to be up here with you. So, and hearing, I had a chance to read this book. You guys definitely need to purchase this book. And, um, you know, just some of the stories about Star Trek and everything that you went through um, working at Paramount Studios. I just, you know, um, the first time I got to meet you some years ago, I was just like, oh my gosh, I really want to like talk with her some more. So I found her on Facebook and she's kind of like, oh, you know, who's this weirdo? Um, but, <laughs> but we started talking some more and I, I was asking her some questions and then, you know, you gave me the honor to. What were you most interested in about the story? What was I most interested in? I, you know, I think it was, you know, just back in the day and making changes. I, you know, I, as being a, a black female and working in the tech industry and, um, you know, some of the, the things that I, I've had to overcome, it was just amazing to hear 
or to read, you know, some of the, the things that you um, overcame, you know, working at Paramount uh, Studios I, and just changing people's perception. And that that's really important um, because sometimes we, you know, we see things in black and white and we, um, you know, forget that, you know, we're all just, you know, one, one person, one race type of thing. So, yeah. Larry, what about you? What, what <laughs> stuff did I put in here that made you go, oh? I, well, I, it, it's interesting because we were talking about the Watts riots or revolt, Harry. That's really, that was a spark. Would you say that's the spark? That's just what was interesting to me too. I mean, it's all interesting. It's all amazing. And we should say real quick while I'm thinking about it, you have a full memoirs coming. Yeah. Everybody, you should know this. She has a big book coming this fall. This is a special just for us still be. How many copies? 250. She has 250 copies of this, so make sure and get by the table. Yes. Yeah. So once they're gone, they're gone. <laughs> this is this is Trek centric with a little bit. Of, but it's that was that was it, would we say that Lucy, who was running the studio by then, Desi had vamoosed. <laughs> Lucy, it was a corporate thing. To we should have we should what a concept. We should have start having diversity in our in our workforce. Was that? I mean, what was the what was the trail that got oh, you into the front door of Desi Lou from from after? That? I think it was I think it was Lucy uh, going recruiting people because at that time the black people at Desi Lou were the janitors, the cooks, the cleaners, the actors who played janitors, cooks, <laughs> cleaners. Um, so I was a bit different, and the way that. The genes cast Star Trek. That was a bit different. But what you guys really may not be aware of is that behind the scene, behind on the other side of the camera, there was diversity there too. The very first black assistant director through the DGA program, Charlie Washburn, who I turned to Charlie Wash Tub. <laughs> washing machine, wash bottom, and a few other things, also known as Charlie Star Trek, because that's how he answered the phone. He was always the first one to get to the phone. It was Charlie Star Trek. <laughs> so, and Wa Chang. Oh, let's talk about Wa Chang. Okay, I think I have something to watch in here. Is there, if I say the name Wa Chang, this is another name. Part of it's because of the way the TV industry works. You knew, no, when you watch the end, now, in the 60s, there were very few. In the 80s and 90s, there were a lot more, and now it feels like the credits go on for a thousand years after those 42, those 47 producers at the front, right? Yeah. But you have to have, no matter how many names you see on the screen in the era, there are plenty more people on the studio payroll and vendors who are supplying whatever department it is. There are so many more people that work on a show. And Wa Chang is one, and I love your story about it, I'm going to let you tell it. But he contributed so many iconic things, and his name is never in a credit, just like yours. Okay, I'm also going to backtrack. Charlie, Charlie Star Trek, was incredibly good-natured. His smile was rarely dipped into concern, always returned. You could rely on him. He got the job done. He was one of the reasons Trek had a great crew. His willingness and good humor rubbed off. It was a crew that worked well together. And there, caring about the past and the show, created an onset atmosphere that was good for actors and for the direct guest directors. Charlie wanted to be a director. He did all the right things. He was competent, capable, likable, polite, hardworking, rule following. But he was black, and the door wasn't yet open. Charlie worked harder and became a very successful first AD and the production manager. He even got a couple of acting spots. But Charlie, although he was capable of directing, Hollywood was rough on people and dreams, and a directing slot was never to be his. Even though he planned on writing about his experience, except for a couple of interviews, we have little of his words. He died before his book happened, and he deserved better. Mm. Now, when the episode arena was finished, the Gorn, the reptilian creatures, who had battled Kirk, the female wearing a mini skirt because Bob Justin wanted to make sure you knew which one was female and which one was male. <laughs> Moved into Bob's office. That Bob Justin, mm -hmm. who was associate producer and at times assistant director and 
I finally ended yeah. up producing. Producing. Associate, he was basically the blind producer. Associate producer doesn't do him justice. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. Okay. Um, Gua Chang and his partner, Gene Warren, who created the Gorn, also created masks, props, and creatures like the salt monsters, um, the keeper, the salt vampire, and he physically created the triples. He also designed and built the tricorder and the flip open communicator, which influenced modern, modern mobile phone designers. Wa was one of the people you could hear coming. That was the result of the heavy, clanging metal braces that caused him to swing his leg from the hip. One after another. Acting out, plank, acting out, and planking down, and clanking. His braces had to be unlocked for sitting and locked for walking. At 21, Juan, a promising sculptor, contracted polio, which was still around and not yet eliminated by the vaccine that arrived in the 50s. The man responsible for many identical tricks wasn't a member of the property union, or likely to be. The union wasn't taking any Asian members at all. The proper union wasn't interested in being inclusive, and the Deputy Z. Lu studio prop makers were supported by their union. They warned the studio that non-union props could not be used on Star Trek. So why would drop by to visit with Bob Justman? <laughs> They'd have a friendly conversation, and at some later date, Watch well, would drop by for another visit, and he would just happen to have a prop that would be perfect for inclusion in the episode Bob may have mentioned, and Bob would buy it. Hua Chang didn't design for Trek, he just happened to have made things that they wanted and needed and purchased. The union was safe from invasion of those that were different, and Trek had another diverse input. It was I was always pleased to hear Hua coming because I knew something interesting was happening. God. That's amazing. So he had, yeah, yes. The last 10 or 15 years, Hua Chang's name has gotten out. As so many other people who were falling through the cracks about getting the credit they deserve for all kinds of things over the years. But I, I did not know until I read your book that he had pulled. It was basically like FDR, like Franklin Roosevelt, yeah. and having the big heavy braces yeah. before we eliminated Pulley and the song. So thank you for that, uh, and you made it very visceral. But again, another another person who had been shut out of the credit machine, who's now, and he died, I think he was just starting to be, you know, as an old man, he is just starting to get some recognition when he passed. But uh, another another bit from your book. Tell me though, what was your, how did you walk in the front door of Desi to get your audition and that your, your interview? What was, how did that set up? Other than the mini skirt. Uh, other than your mini skirt. <laughs> well, they couldn't see your mini skirt until you walked in the door. <laughs> I don't know. What, what, what am I going to say? What, what is this? Now, right? We were talking about how you were going, how you got your interview in at Desi Globe. Well, well, Gene Kuhn took you yeah. because of the skirt. Yeah. They look, wait a minute. Maybe I'm not getting this. It was just a joke. It was very. It was a joke. See, yes. that's where you're deaf. Mm -hmm. and you're not even, <laughs> you can't hear jokes. Darn, guys. <laughs> okay, we'll try that. <laughs> But I got in the door, mostly because we talked about Grand Prix car racing. See, my mom didn't like my afro. She was a hairdresser. And I remember her, oh gosh, she hated it so much. I couldn't go in her beauty salon. I'd have to go outside, knock on the door, tell the receptionist I was there, and then wait outside downstairs. This is at your mom's shop? At my your mom's beauty shop. shop? Okay. Yeah, she, she didn't go for my kind of hair. Anyhow, so um, now I might be off track again. Well, she she wanted you to be like the Supreme. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so I got the wig, I put on a suit and gloves, but I was sneaky. I wore my driving gloves. So Ernie Scanlon, who interviewed me, noticed them, and I felt sort of comfortable with him after a while. He didn't ask about my shorthand, of which I had none. Um, I could type. Um, and we ended up talking about Grand Prix racing. It was like, oh yeah, those Shelby Cobras, they are really hot. And they're gonna be it, you know. That was it, so I knew I had the job. This was the hiring person at Desilu? That was the hiring person at Desilu. But you were in just the pool, right? At the beginning. No, there was no pool, I was it. 
No. <laughs> no. I was the floater. I floated. Desi Blue had three studios. I floated to any of the, of, the, of the studios that they wanted. Oh, you were down at Culver City? I worked at Culver City. And Coanga. Star Trek was shooting down there. I was working there. Yeah. Oh, uh, I went yeah. to Coanga and I worked at Gower. So, and like I said, I worked in every department. I worked in payroll. Uh, well, I know you worked at the gate, too. You buzzed oh, people in. Yes, because yes, you have I controlled yeah. that button <laughs> for the first time I had power. <laughs> and of course, I abused it. <laughs> Good for you. It was a little overdue, I'd say. Who do you, do you remember letting anyone, did you ever have an incident at the gate? I'm not talking about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that answered my you question. You have to read it in the book. Okay. I'm not going to put right. my humiliation out here for everybody to play over. No. <laughs> so, I want to, so we're talking about Jean Coon. So, okay, so, now Jean Coon did not hire you just for your miniskirt. Or what do you, or, 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 well, I mean, well, you guys bonded really well eventually. Was there a spark at the beginning beyond just... I looked at him, I thought, darn, he looks like a grumpy old man. And then I learned he'd been a Marine. And I was, had married a Marine, and I had a lot of respect for them. And then I heard that he'd been at uh, some of the worst places in Korea. Oh, the Chosun Reservoir? Yeah. Chosun Reservoir. I think, uh, I have it in here, I, I'll, I'll try to remember how it goes. He was with, he served with Chesky Fuller, who was deified by the Marine uh, uh, recru uh, recruiters and, 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 what do you call those DI? Drill instructors? Yes. And the DIs. And, and they, the recruits used to have to say, good night, General Fuller, wherever you are. So he said to them, he said, we are, when all these Chinese had joined with the North Koreans and surrounded, he said, they're in front of us, they're in the back of us, they're to the side of us, that means we can shoot in any direction and kill those bastards. <laughs> and I think a little bit of Gene's sense of humor came from those days, because if you read his two of his books, uh, Short End of the Stick, and uh, I've got the other at this moment. Actual novels, he wrote two novels. Yeah, the yeah, two of them. Short End was one of them, and then there, there was another one, but both of them are funny, and they're all about military. And you can see that reflected in what he did when he came to Star Trek, the banter between the men. But the banter, between Dr. McCoy and Spock and, and, and all of them, underlying that was respect, deep respect and affection. That part didn't always pop up, but in times when something was happening, you could tell how much they cared about each other. And the joking was just sort of like, oh, a nice way of saying, I really like you. <laughs> well, he, he had a career. I think he wrote some, he had, you know, there was a TV, that, TV was all like one or two showrunners and everything was freelance, right? It's not like today when you, you had a writing staff, eight, nine people, now you've got, feels like you've got 20 people but only 10 episodes a year or something. <laughs> but he, he came in midway through the first season, I think he started with Mary. So he was, he had his job and then he met you and said, I need an executive secretary, I'm looking around. How about you, right? Mm -hmm. So when you, when he said, come work for me, was it an immediate? Yes. Well, as a young, trendy black woman, I had some reservations about working for a middle-aged white dude called Coon. <laughs> <laughs> I was sort of concerned that one day someone might call me Coons, can I help you? <laughs> but when it happened, it, it, it knocked me out. It rocked me because it came from someone I cared about a lot and I wasn't expecting it there. But Michelle was there. Ah, Michelle. She and I were related by marriage. Her ex-husband and my ex-husband married the same woman. <laughs> so Michelle named us the ex-wives in law. <laughs> and I was so grateful that there was someone else there that could help show me the way because I was in a foreign land 
even though it was only a couple of miles from where I lived. It was a different world. And Nichelle was there. And hold this for a second. Sure. <laughs> and you could hear the pen <laughs> Thank you. Unlike the men on the show, Michelle had no insurance assurance of inclusion in the scripts or how many lines beyond handing frequencies are open, sir. The writers wrote for a man's world. Women were mostly sex objects or love interests. For a brief period, Michelle had a contract, but Bob Justman suggested it be dropped. He thought they'd made a mistake in making her a serious deal. Quote, they could have bought her for less, he said in a memo. He suggested she'd be that better value on an as-needed basis. Because of their failure to provide more inclusion in the scripts, she had often been paid four days' salary for one or two days' work. It was suggested the new offer be made on a take-it-or-leave-it basis and would be considerably less. Grace Lee Whitney, who played Janice Rand, had also had the same treatment. That made Michelle no different than any temporary worker. I had been one and could relate, needing to be available whenever they called, not a scheme, salary based on the union rate, maybe boosted by an agent. No wonder she got tired and wanted to quit. But Michelle never let it show. She was always Miss Thang. <laughs> Serenely above the ordinary, working hard to make everything look effortless. Michelle never got to show off all of her abilities. But being black and female, she couldn't be ignored either. Yeah, that's good. I, I was just thinking, I don't know if I want to talk about this. Oh, you want to save it for people to get the book, or you just don't want to go there for something? It, it was just basically the, the, the makeup in the studio. Uh, some, some crew members just were not used to working with black folks, and oh. the makeup in the studio resembled sort of the Malibu divide. Mm -hmm. That means the folks who lived on the beaches were the social liberals, while the folks that lived in the hills were a red state of social conservatives. She was a gracious lady, and just about everybody from work was invited to her chitlins. Chitlins? You said? Siri! Oh. What are chitlins? <laughs> Gosh, that smell really bad, but tastes great. And she'd have them, uh, uh, she had a pot on her stove, on her mom's uh, pot on the stove that was two burners wide, and it would be full. And I'd be the head guard and say, this isn't your counter, you can't eat anymore. Can I put a few more in? Can I fit a few more bites in? Can I eat a little bit more? But she was always the gracious lady. <laughs> yeah. and, yeah, and we're thinking about her so much more now. You're right, though, about her just kind of being above it all. Yes. She had that regal. That re she was a role model for you because she had a few years on you. You were the young, young one, and she'd been around the block yeah. in all kinds of situations. So you looked up to her. her and I, Charlie Washburn, who I got to know, in his life told me he'd say he would say there was Andy, there was Michelle, there was me, and the guy that had the roach coach at noon had the lunch wagon, and then after lunch he would take it off and he would do shoe shines for the executives, have his business. And he's like, and that was about all of us at the time. No, there was Stanley Robertson. And, well he was at NBC though, right? Talk he about was, Stanley was, Robertson. He was, he was on our crew, babe. Okay, yeah. Okay, let's see what I have here. There was a, there was an executive that got to give infamous show notes back on scripts. But they were great notes if you actually read them. They are infamous. They're only infamous because Gene made an issue of bad notes. But if you read them in the Cushman books... And he did well, want he, he so the shows not to be on the set. He wanted them to be someplace out... Uh, yeah, he was, wanted the planet shows, but then they were telling him to spend less money. But, yeah, yeah. But then, and then there wasn't the money. But he wanted. To, can you please not start the next episode with the teaser on board the Enterprise? He wanted it someplace else. He was good. He was good at that. Okay. Um, Stanley Robertson. I thought I was going that place. Where did I go? Oh, this very second. Okay, sure thing. Stanley. <laughs> Stanley. And your pipe. Oh, page 164K, over here. Oh, good, an index. All right. 
<laughs> he was not He was black. He was formidable. He was determined. He deserves to be included. Stan Robertson, our NBC program manager. I'd heard about Stanley before we met. He was a distant relative of, of a friend, and she bragged about him. After 14, 14 major eye operations, attending a school for the blind, and majoring in journalism at LA City College, Stanley became a reporter at the largest circulation black newspaper in the West, the Los Angeles Sentinel. And it wasn't before long before Stanley was their managing editor. He became an associate editor at a national black publication, Every Magazine, before he took a gamble and gave up print success to go back to pursue a communication degree at USC. With his poor eyesight, he had chosen a challenge as well as a passion. Stanley started at the bottom as a page of the local NBC affiliate. It was a long bus ride because his limited vision meant he was unable to drive. That was it. Um, I think Wait, he took a bus into work yeah. at NBC. He couldn't drive. And he couldn't, they weren't going to give him a driver, so wow. Well, he was only a program manager then. I mean, he became their That's first uh, person of color to be a vice president at NBC. Yeah. But then he was just a lowly. Wow. Uh, he had to take the bus and did his NBC job, that yeah. middle management job. Wow. But Stanley okay. did the hard yards. I'm pleased that at 75, he produced a biographical drama, Men of Honor, about another African American first to achieve against incredible odds. I like to think that he felt that it was his story on the screen and an acknowledgement of what he had achieved. So, yes. Mm. Yes. Can I just say that we're getting these things recorded from your very personal I was there standpoint, little bits and pieces. And you pieces. guys probably know about, more about Star Trek than I do, but I was there. <laughs> <laughs> And again, I, I just, I wanted you guys to know a bit about Gene Kuhn. Well, let's talk about Gene Kuhn. What was it like when you were first, when you, when you sat down and he says, come work for me, and you said, okay, you talked a little, but really those first days, did you have like a, nah, I don't want to go there. I'd rather talk about Gene. Some of the things that people got wrong. Let's do that. One of the biggest things they got wrong was Gene Hold on, I'm getting the one that we start with a place of not knowing a whole lot to begin with. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because he died so soon. But Gene, I want to do this. One. Okay, hold on. Yes. <laughs> Is that okay, guys? Do you mind me fumbling around? Oh, please, 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 please. Because your fumbles are our so uh, Gene, lights in the wilderness. Yeah. Gene, Gene uh, I'll go back and Gene was there. But at the moment, I just want to talk about how he left. Because so many people said that um, that Gene had left because of a divorce. Um, that Gene had left because of something else. But it wasn't about a divorce. It was the battle, I think. I'll, I'll start there. But, uh, before Gene left, okay. I think the myth implication claimed that Gene left because he was going through a breakup with his wife, Joy, and that contributed to his leaving Star Trek was another thing Bob Jasmine and Herb Solo didn't verify and got wrong, and threw them a few others. Okay, Joy didn't give him much. Joy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but he and Jackie didn't get together then. That happened later. Okay, sure, the great bird was around less often. He had a back door. And he often slipped in and out. We didn't even know he was there. And now you're talking about, you say you called Gene Kuhn Gene. Yeah. And you called Gene Roddenberry. The great bird of the galaxy. <laughs> That's another one of Bob Justman's nicknames. Right. Uh, Gene Kuhn was Encino Fat. <laughs> and Roddenberry was the great bird. But when you say Gene, you always mean Gene Kuhn. I do. That was your Gene. That was my and team. you say great bird when you mean Gene Rodney. Yeah. Okay. Before Gene left Trek, to me the most visible sign of his growing need to escape was his getting rid of his old, shabby Toyota Land Cruiser, which had ferried the many dogs he and Joy had back and forth to the bed at a price he grumbled about. The new car was a surprise. Gene had dumped his old four-wheel drive and bought an E-Type Jag. <laughs> then I knew something was wrong. The atmosphere was off. I mean, I liked to drive it, and I did whenever I had an excuse to use his car. But it was such a drastic change of style for him. 
I remember standing on the main corn street in my neighborhood talking with a friend who was a psychiatrist in private practice when uh, one of those E-types drove past and he started jabbing his finger at it. It's a dick, it's a dick. And that's what I was reminded of by Gene's new car. But what did the new car mean? Why did Gene need a dick? <laughs> he had everything together, though perhaps he was grinding his teeth more. It could have been the memo from Stan Robertson wanting the next strip to, script to have an edge of the seat teaser, preferably any place but on board, the Enterprise. Or Joe Pierce calling from research saying that the necessary plot point was scientifically impossible. It could have been a letter from the Writers Guild, an arbitration decision that would give him more pain than gain. It was probably all of them, plus the sailor designated Paramount. Herb Solo's new, less supported role, the network's airtime placement, and the rarity of great bird sightings. Gene was a writer. He didn't really like actors, and he was most impressed by directors who got the script shot on schedule, and he left post production to the actors. But he also had to do a rewrite of every script. It was necessary. Now, it's hard enough to come up with an idea for an entertaining script for a TV show, even when writing about something you know, but to ask the writer to come up with a script that's good about something that's totally outside their experience makes it pretty hard. Writers with a science fiction back background had it just as hard. Experienced science fiction writers are used to creating their own future, civilizations, habits, manners, but Star Trek had its own, and they had to do everything within the Trek universe. So. Well, that was one of the reasons he left. And then when he left, he did meet Jackie again. He went to Universal and pretty soon he said, okay, come on over. And he made a place for me working with him. But Gene, we fit back in, nothing had changed. Soon I was commenting on the script, suggesting actors for Bart and making sure his upper supply was uninterrupted, and that he had his hot chocolate at three, and the slip of it was there for later if he felt like it. But Gene was lacking something. I know it takes a thief wasn't as exciting to make a stretch or potentially pertinent, the positives which had less creative conflict and issue. But why was he still flat? I hated watching a Gene without any spark. A good friend of his came into town from Reno. Even that didn't frighten him. Ken Cole was a wonderful writer and a very funny man, and he had an interesting mind and was a company that we all enjoyed. He also had great weed that he grew. <laughs> Another friend of his, Steve Bochco, was, who created Steel Street Blues and Change TV Forever, had an office just upstairs from us. He and I had also become friends. Steve was living with Barbara Bossett, who became one of the Hill Street leads. Ken took me to dinner at their place. Ken had a wife back home, Rio. In Reno, and I, and I was never going to sleep with him, but he liked to imagine that I would someday. <laughs> well, Barbara thought I was sleeping with Ken, and she gave me dirty looks all evening. I did a dramatic retelling of the event free of the evening for Gene, exaggerating Barbara's behavior only a little. He thought it was funny, but the laughter was weak. Nothing else was even making him smile. That would change. Gene was going through the player's cutter's directory. Ted's a thief wasn't casting anything at the time, but producers often had him look through the book before asking the show's casting director was suggested. Then Gene gave me some strange instructions. He showed me a picture of a pretty woman, Jackie Mitchell. Call the agent and set up a casting interview. No need for casting to be involved. Okay, <laughs> but unusual. I was also to find out if her last name had been Owens. That was also a little unusual. But it wasn't weird. I reckon the men he worked with her before was verifying it was the same person. But then it did get a bit weird. I was to say the name of the show, but not mention the producer's name. Okay. Then I'd be starting to wonder what was going on. Don't mention his name. Gene stressed that. The appointment was before his afternoon nap, so he had nothing else scheduled till later. Jackie arrived, bright, smiling, and friendly. When I opened his office door, she seemed to bright. I wish I'd seen his face when he saw her. Darn. I did notice it was a really, really long interview. And then it was a really, really, really long interview. <laughs> the 
The change in him was evident when he opened the door to his office and escorted her out. He continued through my office, and he didn't stop at the door. He walked through to the building interest. He'd asked me to arrange a special drive on and she was parked right in front, so I left my desk and had a peek. He walked into her car and took the key and opened the door. Something was definitely going on. I was at the door when he came back and followed him to his office and plopped myself down. Okay, what's going on? The radiance of his presence said something big had happened. And as I waited, he got himself together and began to tell me the story of how they first met. They were young, Jackie just leaving her teens, and they were in radio school. He and Jackie and his now wife Joy had been students. They were old friends, but Jean had a special thing for Jackie. Unfortunately, Jackie was engaged. To Jean, being engaged was like marriage, something to be respected. And he didn't make his feelings for her known. He had loved her then and was too much of a gentleman to cut in on another guy. He had married Joy, and though the years, through the years, a bunch of dogs had connected them, not a lot else. Finding Jackie again and finding her single, he had a chance. She didn't hold back. She told him she'd been married, had a daughter, and worked as a model. She preferred runways because she liked the eye contact and strutting, and that she had cared about him back then. But the rule was women didn't chase men, and he hadn't made the move. Jean wasn't going to blow it this time. Yeah. So what happened there was the three of them were students together. So there's Jean, there's Jackie, and Joy. He really liked Jackie. When he met her, she was engaged. He stayed out of the way. Joy was kind of like a number two then. And they were married and had 20, 30 years together. And then he found out Jackie was single. And that was it. That was it. And he, they, he divorced Joy and set her up. They had a, they had a daughter. He has, Jackie had a daughter. Yes. I mean, did, did he and Joy have a daughter too? No. Okay. No, no. So this is Jackie's. Okay. I, I've been. Catherine, Catherine yes. was Jackie's daughter. Okay. Right. Right. So it was like it was time, but it sounds like he was sagging. But he knew she was in the in the actor's book. That whole thing with the interview was just to. Well, my know, daughter Paula, who tells me that. He saw it, a boom uh, on the on sunset that there was a, a bulletin board. Uh, what, what are you called? Yes. Billboard. 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 Thank you. A billboard. And um, yeah, but then you guys want to know how badly I screwed up after that? Yeah. You screwed up. I screwed up. What did you do? Okay, I screwed up. <laughs> Within days, he informally ended his marriage, he moved out, and he and Jackie and Kathleen, Jackie's daughter, became a family. Jean quickly bought Jackie a new Mercedes Benz, a boring white one. He wore, he, but because he, he wanted his love held safely. He bought a new dog, and they found a house near me, off Mount Helen in Laurel Canyon. Encino Fats was no more. He moved out of the valley and moved on. Jean getting back with Jackie so quickly meant that Joy didn't see it coming. In the space of a week, her decades-old marriage was over. When Jean asked me to send Joy roses, I couldn't be bothered sending this wounded woman something so boring, prosaic, especially at a vulnerable junction. I mean, I I wanted her to. Where is it? Okay, okay, it is there. I'm sorry. I could have done this better, I'm sure. And I didn't until you got what you got. Okay. <laughs> something so close, so boring. She could use some cheering up. I mean, something special, exotic, expensive, and cool. Show her something, show her how much he valued her. The florist agreed with me that the bouquet I chose was special and fabulous. I didn't get a chance to tell you since Jackie had come into his life, he often left early. I was sure I'd made the right choice of flower. After all, she was in his 40s. He was so old. <laughs> and so totally not with it. I had taken on the challenge of being a great PA. My job was to make it easy for him to do his job, writing and running the show, to anticipate and interpret what and ways that help. I got it. I know what I'm doing. I trust my judgment and my taste, and I'm used to pretty much following my own lead. Great flowers ordered. Tick all done. 
take and on to the next thing on my super PA list. <laughs> I'm at work before him the next day and patting myself on the back when he comes in. Something is very, very, very wrong. His body has changed shape, caved in, and his face looked the way he looked at me. His face looked sad again. Great. This book I haven't seen since Jackie brought him back to life. The flowers? Yes. I got her something really good. Really cool, not boring roses. I got her some. Yes, she called and told me. You got her anthuriums. And he shares with me the story of a special time. Joy and Jean on a romantic holiday in Hawaii. She'd seen the flowers for the first time when Jean presented her with a vibrant bouquet of them. And they had come in a red, pink, white, even green. And importantly, I didn't pay attention that they grow in the shape of a heart. A message. I wasn't expecting that. I had never before thought of him as poetic or subtle. From his telling, I'm sure Joy reminded of that time he thought him cruel. Roses he'd asked for, and roses would have been appropriate. I have no words. I'm a dumb show off. I was I'm supposed to make his life easier, not more painful. Especially at this vulnerable junction. I have totally fucked up. <laughs> it happens. Jean knows I didn't mean to harm. He shrinks into his office. It's a painful lesson. I've heard someone I care about. And the internal dialogue starts. Blame is a powerful double-edged shaming tool. First you should on yourself, and then you put the should on someone else. It can take a while to stop shooting. We didn't talk about it again. I didn't try to make amends, didn't do something like call Joy and confess it was me. I was frozen. Joy shut down communication after the flowers. And for years I felt guilt when the that time was mentioned in interviews. Joy refused to see or speak to him, even when she was sick, when she was dying. And I felt it was because of the flower. Hmm. But what are the, what are the odds? The flowers you thought were so cool were the flowers he sent her on their first romantic. Yeah. yeah. What are the odds? I don't know. Hold on. What's happening with you over there? I don't want you sitting there quiet. You got to help me here. <laughs> I, you are doing just fine on your own. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think so. Man. You told me. You told me you had a Janos Prohaskas memory. Oh, Janos. Do we know Janos Prohaskas? Yes. The guy who came in and said, how can you use that? He was a puppeteer gymnast that would do costumes, and he came in with something that looked like the, the uh, Horda, and said, hey, can you use this? And Gene said, yeah, I'll write a story about that in six days. Uh, he did. Yeah. Um, he, he, did it, he did it again with something else, which you really remember. I reckon we all have favorites. While City in the Answer Forever is one of mine, I have special affection for Devil in the Dark. From the time Gene walked in the door, still laughing about something Janos had gone up to, he was wrapped up. Janos, perhaps, this was our special alien guy and would pitch possible creatures. If they were, then Janos would bring them to the show and be hired to be inside. Usually curious about everything, I had stayed away from this unveiling. Janos felt creepy to me. I mean, not the guy himself, nice man, good actor, tall and good looking. To me, he became who, whatever, whoever's outer skin he inhabited, especially the apes. He moved like them, acrobatically leaping up onto tables and other things. He became an animal, a horny animal. <laughs> After one encounter, I kept my distance. I don't know if Jean told me about the egg Janos had made while demonstrating his new unnamed creature to Jean and the guys. The story goes that Janos came in costume weird, being lay on the floor, looking like a big rock. Then Janos started to wiggle around, humped a bit, and then scooted off, leaving a rounded stone behind him as though the creature had given birth. It does sound like Janos, and Jean certainly had given birth to an idea. The Hoarder was an idea that would become a story and screenplay in record time, in days. A record for Trek in most series, the use of length of time from idea to screenplay is at least six weeks. Jean Coon was one of the fastest, if not the fastest, writer in Hollywood. And I helped by visiting Dr. High, the pills man. It also meant that I could bring back Pink's Chili Dogs, because Pink's and Lucy's <laughs> Adobe Chicken's Tacos were our favorites. Yes. <laughs>
for a couple of times. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, here's what's interesting. So, when he let, now let's talk about this. I want to make sure you get this in. There's a lot of talk. You started to say this. Why? You basically are saying Gene Kuhn left Star Trek because he was burned out. Burned out. And this is before Jack It was painful back. for him to rewrite writers that he loved, he respected. And like like Harlan or Theodore uh, Theodore Sturgeon, I mean these were two of my buddies, me and Harlan. Harlan made me an honorary Jew, <laughs> subject for two thousand years of retroactive persecution. But when I saw an apartment down the street, and I went to apply for it, and they immediately say, "Oh, sorry, it's been rented. Oh, sorry, we don't take children. Oh, sorry, no, no, no. Uh, I forgot." We've already signed the contract, it's too late. So I went back, because I'd heard that story before. I knew what was going on, so I went back and I told Harlan about it. Harlan went there and he came back and he had become a male me. Working at Desi Lu with two children, the same age as my kids, everything. And he said, we got them, they offered me the apartment. So Harlan was trusted me out of my buddy. In fact, in his book, uh, one of the book, Dangerous Visions, that he that he um, signed, I, I, I love the autograph. I can do it one hand, I okay. think, or I can't it's do it at all. <laughs> when I think I might find it. Oh, there, there we go, there we go, there it is. Yes. There you go. <laughs> it's a copy of Gentleman Junkie, and Harlan is written here for Andy. <clears throat> Most lovely of women. This stray collection of pieces of my life with friendship and deep affection, Harlan Ellis. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah. Let's talk. Talk. Speaking of people who didn't have a voice, and we've got five minutes, and I want to. There's a couple. I'm sorry, but there's so many more. Well, they have to get the book. Oh, okay. but that's that's the way this works. Eh? It's gonna be okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Um, guys, but it's okay. Okay. It's I okay. did want you to mention. Let's mention somebody who really gets little attention and should. A guy named Russell Bates. Oh, okay. Let's see if we can find that one because <laughs> Russell Bates yeah. was okay. It says right here that it might be on page one eighty. <laughs> so, Russell Bates, a, a Comanche um, uh, Native American. Gene she, she liked mentoring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, what a G's. He mentored two from the young Nick Desi Lou and another two at Universal. I, I knew we were still learning the very personal stuff about each other. We were friends now, and I felt free to ask my why questions. I had uh, discovered that Gene shared deep feelings about the unfair pe treatment of the first people where he was born. The country, the county Gene came from was the land of Chief Standing Bear, who participated in a trial that changed the status of Native Americans. There was no recognition of Native American rights until the court determined if Standing Bear had a legal right to a writ of habeas corpus. Was Standing Bear a person? To deny his legal right to the writ, the court would have to conclude that he was not a person, not a human being. Standing Bear gave elo eloquent testimony, and for the first time in the U.S., in their native land, first people were declared to be people, to be humans. When Russell Bates entered his life, Gene was glad to be able to help promote supporting young Native American. Rare grins occupied Gene's face every time Russell came into the office. They spent hours together. Russell was making progress. He was a talented writer. And Gene enthusiastically read and commented on his work. He would have an episode to set bit soon. Then suddenly, Russell was gone. I tried to find him. The phone was disconnected, but there was a message from him. Russell had received a sign. A particular animal was seen in a place in a way that said Russell must return home immediately. It was tribal business, and even a chance at Hollywood couldn't stop that. No time for goodbye, no plans for the future. Gene was gutted. But we should say Russell was able to write, co-write an animated series script, How Sharper Than a Circum's Tooth, or The yeah. Circum's Tooth. Yes. Which, if you look at it, was these episodes submitted for the animated series for TAS for its Emmy, and to this day remains the only writing Emmy that Star Trek ever uh, won. Hopefully that will change at some point. 
But yes, a protege of Gene Coons, absolutely co-writer. Mm -hmm. We're gonna. Have, I would. I think you wanted to end. Did you want to end with something about the Great Bird? I, I have to tell you one thing about the Great Bird. I, I was really unhappy that I wasn't able to pursue becoming a, a producer in America. Um, I, at Universal, Gene knew me, he knew my work, he knew my competence, he knew that I spent all my time in post-production on the dubbing stage, in the film scoring, or in the editing room. That was my heart, I loved it, because you could make things different in those places. And so when um, we were at Universal, the associate producer moved up to produce, and I said, Gene, I'd like the associate producer slot. And I'd been hanging out with Melvin Van People, so Melvin had put some ideas in my head like, you can do this, you can do this, I don't care that you don't see any black people doing this job, you can do it. So I said, I want the job, and Gene said, oh, I'll let you know. And the next day he came to me and he said, no. Um, and then he said, it's because the men on the dubbing stage would have to watch their language if a woman was present. And I said, well, I don't give a flying fit this fuck. Well, I <laughs> But I didn't get it. And I was disappointed many, many times. And finally, after leaving, I, I got a fellowship to the AFI. Did nothing worked. It was the wrong time. And I got a chance to go off. And I ended up in Australia. I hit the hip, I left Hong Kong and hit the hippie trail with my backpack and I had a ball and I ended up meeting a guy on a beach in Bali and he said, do you want a mango? I said, yes. So I ended up in Australia as you would. <laughs> in Australia, in Australia, they, I had unearned approbation. They esteemed African Americans. They figured we all could sing dance, and play basketball. <laughs> so it was up to me to do whatever I wanted. And I, of course, having been with Malcolm and Martin and all those, I went to the disruptors, the people who were looking to make change. And to get the first Aboriginal doctor, lawyer, teachers, and all that. So I made, I said I want to make a film. So I ended up producing and directing a, a documentary film for them that won a few awards and stuff like that. But. I went back to, to California and I went to visit the bird and I hadn't seen him for a few years. And I'm all full of myself. I'm an award winner. <laughs> I got a deal going with, I think it was not Jerry Bixby, it was another one of the Star Trek uh, writers. He gave me an option on, on, uh, on his book and I'd written the screenplay and I was looking to make, to move, make the film. So I go into Gene Rodriguez's office and I said, oh, Gene, and I put my feet up on his desk. <laughs> and I leaned back. And we talked, and we talked, and then it was time to go. And when I left, he stopped and hugged me and held me. And I knew he didn't mind that. He knew that I was just trying to show off that I, I, had, suddenly, I had finally achieved. And he wrote a beautiful inscription in the book about one that we both loved. And when I left, I walked out feeling lucky to have known him, to have been him who I've been in my life. And I'm sorry I didn't get to tell you about this David Bill Shatner scared the crap out of my daughter. <laughs> well, we'll just have to get her to come back. I was going to say next year's convention. Next year's convention. Two sentences. Yeah. Two sentences. You have to hear this real quick. Okay, how did Bill Shatner scare your little daughter? <laughs> well, when she came in crying, I thought, what, what is this? What's going on? Bill, Bobby, Bill, Bill, Bill. I thought, what, what is he doing? I'll kill him. He, 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 he. My grandmother's shotgun, I'll come after him. He, 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 he. And I realized that she walked in on him in his dressing room without knocking. <laughs> and he didn't quite have his ensemble together <laughs> and it scared the crap out of her. <laughs> but what, what was more of a concern for me was how would he have handled having a little eight-year-old girl run out of his dressing room in tears? Ooh, that would have been bad. Anyhow, <laughs> 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 I had fun. Thank you so much. And he's going to be in the other room the next couple of days. Goodbye, check it out. Talk to him again. Anyway, so glad we got you here. Give it up. Give it up.
Thank you.